if, if you've ever felt marginalized, if you felt like an outcast, if you've ever felt like you were at a place you didn't belong, if, if you're dealing with anxiety or fear or stress, if, if you've ever felt ostracized, if you've ever had this sense of disconnect, uh, for whatever reason, if you're suffering, if, if, you're, if you're grieving, if you're hurting, this series is for you. We're starting a series on the book of First Peter. And its subtitle is Born Again to a Living Hope. Born Again to a Living Hope. And it's from a circular letter. What I mean by that is the, the author, it's attributed to Peter, sent this to a group of Christians in a, in a bunch of churches in what is now the nation of Turkey. Asia Minor is, is what... Some scholars call it. And, and this letter was written when, when things were really challenging. There was a lot of cultural upheaval. There was a lot of things happening. And there are some that think that there was significant persecution and some that, that would argue and say it was just starting. But, but there's all kinds of stuff that made it tough to live like a Christian in a world that didn't understand. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to read the first nine verses. I'm going to ask you to stand to honor God's word. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 1, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, Exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. That's a lot of Trinitarian teaching right there. Did you catch that? Did you, you see that? How, how Peter winds all that in there? Did, did you? Ooh. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. That's a nice greeting. Hmm. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Sit if you can. <laughs> I like when Rich says that. I'm going to say it now. You know why? Because I can. <laughs> uh, there's two schools of thought 
as to who Peter was addressing this to. Uh, the first school of thought is that he was writing to foreigners or resident aliens. Foreigners, we heard about that last Sunday. This is written to Christians who were not citizens, and this may well have been a majority of Christians in this region, that they were not citizens, uh, that they were vulnerable to abusive treatment by their neighbors and by the local authorities, or they were not looked at well or kindly at all. As resident aliens, they were culturally and religiously different from the majority population. So they're a distinct minority, but they paid taxes and they contributed to the local economy, but they could not, listen to this, they could not inherit property, they could not own property, and they were denied legal protections that citizens enjoyed. So that's, that's one school of thought about who this letter's written to. Uh, there's another school of thought that, that suggests that this was written to spiritual sojourners, and by that I mean those who were exiled spiritually, or as we used to sing about years and years ago, those who are just passing through, those that would have, I guess, dual citizenship, those people who were separated for a time from their eternal home, that they came to a realization that maybe this is a colony, but they're not part of the empire. That this isn't it. I tend to think it was probably both. I think that this letter is going to people in both of these camps. And I, 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 I think it, it just says a lot that both of these have merit. That God's elect and strangers in the world. One expresses relationship to God and the other relationship to people and to those in human society. So I think this was going to an audience of immigrants, and I think this was going to an audience of spiritual sojourners in this world that were temporary residents. And one of the biggest themes, and you understand that when this letter's written, people are going through hard times. There's some difficulty. There's some suffering. There's some cost attached with being a follower of Jesus. So one of the biggest themes for this letter to people who were scattered all over the nation of Turkey was hope. And that's what I want to talk about today. About a living hope. I, I think about those that are dealing with anxiety or those that are hurting or those who are disenfranchised that I, I want to say this to you, that there is hope. Those who feel defeated, those who are grieving, those who are questioning, I have really good news for you, there is hope. And it is not just kind of a nice word or not just kind of a cheerful little, you know, hopefully pick me up. It's, it's real and genuine. And it's living, dynamic. Let's talk about this hope. Um, two thoughts. Here, here's the first one is hope, hope is alive. Hope is alive. Here's, here's what the scripture talks about, that, that there's this new birth, the, the, the new birth, that we can have new life in Christ. And we've talked about it recently, but Paul writes it this way, that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The, the old has gone and the new has come. That, that, that God in his creativity and God in his miraculous ways, where grace is greater than our sin, God gives us new life through Christ. That's, that's good news. Many of you have discovered this. And I, I don't think any of you regret it. Because if you did, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> This, this new birth has, has some interesting outcomes, two outcomes. There's the now, there's in the now, and there's in the then. <laughs> the already but not yet. In, in the now, it brings us joy in the midst of our struggles and challenges. 
And then the then it gives us the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. We receive eternal life from a Savior who has conquered death himself. That's, that's good news. And becoming Christian means that what God did for Jesus on that resurrection morning, he does for you in the very depth of your being. And that's why we have this thing called baptism. Because it's this incredible sacrament that represents what God has done for us. That we've been buried with Christ and we're raised up a new life. Oh, by the way, we have baptism class coming up in a week. Some of you need to make your faith public. If you're a follower of Christ, I believe you should be baptized. If you've not been baptized, what a wonderful way to let people know with a very prominent testimony, your story. Hmm. By the way, all this, all this that we've been talking about makes no sense apart from the resurrection of Jesus. That's, that's it. What does living hope mean? Well, it means that hope is alive and, and, and not dead. It, it means that that. Hope is vigorous. Um, isn't that a good word? I, I like that word a lot. Vigorous. Hope is vigorous. Uh, it's, it's active. Hope is active. It's, it's not dormant. Hope is thriving. Hope, hope is thriving. That it's, there's, there, it's like getting stronger. Hope is growing, not declining or dying. Peter, in this, in this passage, I like most of it. But I like all of it. But there's one verse that kind of makes me a little uncomfortable. It's verse 6. Here's what it says. It says, in all this, you greatly rejoice. Positive. Though for now, for a little while... You may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Suffering in the original here, it, it, it refers to physical pain and emotional pain. I, I think it ties in with mental pain. Quite honestly, uh, last part of that verse uh, causes me to pause. The suffering part. I'm, I'm not real wild about suffering. <laughs> now, I don't know about you all, but I, I'd rather not have suffering, to be honest with you. I prefer problem-free, issue-free living. And Peter has the audacity to say, guess what? You're probably going to go through some suffering. By the way, three weeks from today, there's going to be a message on suffering. I think it's going to help you. So let's be really clear here. Something I love about um, this passage is, and something I love about the way Jesus taught his disciples, and this is in line with his teaching and his thinking, that just because you turn to Jesus to follow him, does not mean a pain-free or problem-free existence. Let me debunk the idea that if you're in Christ, that nothing ever goes wrong for you. <laughs> if you follow Jesus, your life will not be pain-free. Jesus said this at the Last Supper, John chapter 16. Here's what Jesus said in verse 33. In this world, you will have trouble. And I'm so glad he didn't just stop there. Because then he said, but take heart because I've overcome the world. We don't get a pass as Christ's followers. Everyone goes through struggles and crisis. And we're not insulated from tragedy or trials, but we can actually have hope in the midst of those trials, in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the grieving. 
We go through this with what? With a living hope. That this isn't all. We're not there yet. This isn't all there is. And we don't go through it alone. We don't go through it alone. I, I love this story uh, Leonard Sweet uh, writes about in his book, Soul Salsa. He, he talks about a tribe of Native Americans had a really creative, unique practice for training their young men that on the night of this young man's 13th birthday, they placed him in a very dense forest so he would spend the entire night alone. They would blindfold him and take him miles from where they lived, away from the security and safety of his family and tribe. And when they took off, or when he took off the blindfold, he was in the middle of this thick forest all by himself, all night long. I could imagine that every time a twig snapped or, or every time he heard a noise, he, he probably thought it was an animal ready to pounce. Every time an animal howled, he imagined a wolf leaping out of the darkness. And every time the wind blew, he wondered what more sinister sound it masked. And I would think it would have been a terrifying night. After what seemed like a, 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 an eternity, the first rays of sunlight entered the interior of the forest, and looking around, uh, the boy would see the, the flowers and the trees and the outline of the path, and then to his utter astonishment, he beheld the figure of a man standing just a few feet away, armed with a bow and arrow. It was the boy's father who had been there all night long. He had never been alone. He felt like it probably terrified, but he'd never been alone. We don't go through this alone. When we go through sufferings of all kinds, when we go through trials, when we go through difficulties, we don't go through this alone. That's the good news of living hope. And by the way, too, is God is not the, the source of the grief but our suffering does fall within the provision of God's work within our lives, the lives of believers and things we talked about several weeks ago about Romans 8, 28, that in all things God works for the good. Some today are suffering. Some in this room are going through some hard times. Uh, maybe it wasn't what you had in mind Eh, maybe you didn't see it coming. Maybe you're going through some trials. Uh, maybe you're going through some testing. Uh, maybe you're going through some hurt. Maybe you're going through some pain. And it may, be, it may not be anything you did. And yet God can always bring good out of every situation. But maybe today you're hurting. Well, hope is alive, but here's the other thing. <laughs> hope is defiant. <laughs> hope is defiant. A few weeks ago, our worship team sang a, a Johnny Cash song. It was hopping, called Ain't No Grave. <laughs> going to ever hold me down. Whew. See, that's why we have hope, friends. All this happens because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that those who are in Christ possess a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead. And this hope is not just wishful thinking, it's not just rhetoric, it's not just a nice catchphrase, it is a real thing. And it is precisely only because Jesus is alive and no longer dead, that he defied death. He silenced the boast of the grave. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, 55. This is like scriptural trash talk. This is talking smack to death. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? 
Hmm. Hope is defiant. J.I. Packer said this, he said, you could speak of Jesus' rising as the most hopeful, and in parentheses, hopeful thing that has ever happened, and you would be right. No matter what you're facing or going through, whatever you're dealing with, you can have hope because of what Jesus has done for us. I love how the message paraphrases 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. This is so good. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. A few weeks ago, we were in the Apostles' Creed. All through the summer, we, we talked about life everlasting. That's what that's talking about. We have hope now and later. So last Sunday, Denise and I were in uh, South Texas with our oldest son, Josh, and his wife, Elizabeth, and they're a part of a church plant in San Marcos, Texas, and the church meets in an elementary school, and I went with Josh, and I met with Pastor Michael, and we were there unloading the stuff, and they unpack everything out of a trailer early Sunday mornings. It's literally called church in a box. <laughs> And you unload all this stuff out of the box in the humidity of South Texas. It's, I just, I'll just say I took a change of clothes, okay? And it was interesting because church started and Pastor Michael got up to speak and he started talking about hope. And man, I perked my ears up because I thought I'm preaching on that next Sunday. God really spoke to me through Pastor Michael. And he used Lamentations 3, and I thought, oh, I love this passage. Lamentations 3 talks about how living hope is defiant. Here's what Lamentations 3 says. Look at this. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Now, I know some of the stuff that's happening in our church. I mean, people are, are going through some very hard times physically. And people are going through a hard time relationally. And, and some people are going through a lot. There's a lot of grief in this place right now. I grieve over my loss is what Lamentations 3 says. Listen to what verse 21 says though. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning, and I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Remember when Peter was writing about your inheritance? <laughs> the Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will hope in him. You don't hope in a person you don't hope in an institution. You don't hope in a government. You hope in him. That's a basis of our hope. That's a hope that's defiant. Uh, this Lamentations passage was written by Jeremiah at, at the lowest point in his life. And it just seems that hope works best in a time of decline and decay. And it seems like hope shows up in some of the most unusual places, like a cemetery, or a funeral home, or a hospice unit, or a hospital room, or a home that's going through a time of difficulty. A workplace that may not be the easiest to work in, even in what everybody else thinks is a really great family, hope can show up anywhere because it's living and dynamic. It's made possible by a God who loves us so 
that he doesn't just leave us hanging. He doesn't just abandon us. <laughs> we may not see him and we may not feel him, but he's there with us. How fitting these words are. You see, hope is defiant. Hope doesn't arise out of comfort. Hope defies the current set of circumstances. Hope stands toe to toe with the powers that be and trusts that another world is possible. Hope isn't easy. Hope isn't blind optimism. Hope sees potential. Hope lives because it's based on Jesus' resurrection from the dead, his triumph over death. Hope lives because death cannot overcome it. Hope lives because even in the face of suffering and trials, it does not back down or grow faint. Living hope is a hope that gives life. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday, he called me, and uh, he's going through cancer. And, and he told me this, and, and it broke my heart. But he said, I'm, um, I'm not taking any more treatments. I'm, I'm, I'm done. And he said, I'm just going to leave it in the Lord's hands. We, we, we talked a little while, and the Lord reminded me of a verse that, that God gave me for him two or three or four years ago. Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Huh. Something he said got my attention. He, he goes, you know, I'm, I'm not doing so good physically. But he said, spiritually, I'm doing great. See, that's defiant hope. Reminded of what the prophet wrote, Isaiah 40. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Here's the thing. Some of you may not be soaring like eagles right now. And some of you may not be running because you get side aches. For some of you, just to walk a few steps is an incredible, incredible blessing because you're moving forward and he's helping you progress even in the midst of suffering. Well, let me give you a few takeaways and then I want to pray for you and pray for us. Here's the first one, is ask God for help if you're feeling hopeless. Ask God for help. Cry out to God. Thanks be to the God of hope and comfort. Amen? The second thing is, let what you know about God determine your actions in hard times. What you know about God, uh, what we know, uh, can help us in the midst of suffering and hurt, struggle, pain. Third thing is look for connections with other people who have found hope in difficult situations. We use the terminology live connected, and my fear is that we don't always do that. Look for connections. You know, that's one reason our connect groups are so important. We, we don't want people to go through some of this alone. We want people to help and encourage and to bless and to strengthen. Look for people who found hope in difficult situations. I see some in this room right now. I see people who your story, we were singing that song about the story I get hope when I look at you. When I 
when I know your story, when I know what you've gone through, when I know how God's helped you, how God's intervened, how God has supported you. It helps me. Hmm. Look for connections. I, I love the last two verses of what Peter writes. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, salvation of your souls.